Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 246 of the Security Podcast here on the In30 Network. My name is Haim Cohen. Tom is, and everyone made fun of me, but I think Tom's Tom's there. There. Because again, we have the overlays and he's doing all he's doing all the cool stuff, but it doesn't matter. This is an audio podcast, unless you want to see us, but it's an audio podcast. So let's first say hi to Tom. See how he's doing. Hello, everyone. It's look. It's really hard. I mean, you, you've heard this before. It's really hard to find content now. I think we have a good episode for you today. But the problem is that everyone's still quarantining, and it's uh, unfortunately the way that the country is going right now. July twenty first is not going in the right direction. So, so we have three stories for you. Uh, I guess we will start with the big one. I guess we'll start with, with the a small PSA. One. Oh, you want to do your PSA? I do want to do my PSA. Okay, so if you are anything like me and you were helplessly addicted to soda, sugary, carbonated soft drinks, uh, I've got just just the tool to maybe... Is it Slurm? Sort of, it's almost Slurm. It's not as good okay. as Slurm because Slurm does have that radioactive future property to it, which unfortunately this just doesn't have, but it is green. It's, it's in, in a green can. And oh no, I realize I'm just now on a green screen. And so this can looks completely clear. That's awesome. Um, but, uh, just sugar-free flavored seltzer water is delicious. It's bubbly and it has absolutely, absolutely replaced most soda for, uh, for me. Like I'll still have soda in like a cocktail or whatever, but if I just want something bubbly throughout the day, it's just water, man. It's great. It's water and it's bubbly and you can put it in a fancy looking glass and add your own limes. So, uh, yeah, seltzer water. Trust me, it's better than you think. Uh, look, I was addicted to soda for many, many years. And and it took me, like you said, to go to the bubbly seltzer water to do it. And it, it works. So so I will agree with that. And you know what? It's water with some bubbles and it's easier to get. It's at every vending machine. So not the vending machine, but the fountain. Look under the Sprite. There's a little tab there. Usually it's under the Sprite and it will work. So, and uh, if you have a green screen, the can will be clear, which is really cool. So, the whole reason to get it. I'm listening to a message from the stream. Lost my audio, but I think it's okay. So, anyway, let's move on. So, <clears throat> cloud. Let's start with the. I think the easy one. Let's start with Cloudflare. So, Cloudflare went down for about half an hour the other day, and everyone thought the world is ending. So I have two things to say on that. One, the world did not end, but two, Cloudflare is seemingly very, very powerful. So when something like this goes, it's a really bad thing. Yeah, Cloudflare has become basically a single point of failure for the internet right now, uh, at least for many, many sites across the internet. A lot of people use Cloudflare as kind of you know, a caching layer or DDoS protection or DNS or, you know, backbone control flow stuff. Like Cloudflare does a whole lot and their tech stack is honestly really super cool. Um, unfortunately, when you've built all your stuff into one provider, if that one provider has issues, just like we've seen every time GitHub goes down, the, you know, all the communities around code development and deployment start freaking out. Um, you know, when you have a single provider, it does mean that, yeah, only one thing really has to go wrong to, to cause major, major impact, which is what happened here. So, I mean, I guess what they, it's, it's one of those things they provide a good service. So people go, I mean, I think we host in 30 through Cloudflare, at least some of the, the spam filtering protections and the DDoS perfect, uh, protections. And for whatever reason, they do a good job, but again, it's. Tom's going to tell me why it's not called the five nines, but they promise 99.99999% uptime. And here's the, the point zero 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 one percent that it doesn't work. And unfortunately they took, they took a significant part of the internet, just like when Amazon go down, they take a significant part or when dine DNS went down, they take a single, they take a big thing. And and it's one of those, you didn't know what service was listed on it until you realize you can't get there. Exactly. Like uh, one, one thing that was surprising people is they're like, oh, you know, it's, it's got to be a backbone issue or, you know, did, did this cloud provider go down? And like people were speculating a lot until they realized, you know, what, what exactly is, 
you know, do all these services have in common? Oh, they all use Cloudflare in some respect. And yeah, it looks like Cloudflare had some, some major issues. Um, so uh, what basically happened is that um, they saw some congestion on a router in Atlanta, uh, and they wanted to remove some of the Atlanta router's backbone traffic. Um, unfortunately, a one-line change for the BGP routes, because BGP changes have always been problematic across the internet. Honestly, it's it's one of the major gaffes on the modern internet is how powerful and easily abused BGP routes are. So um, it started leaking all the BGP routes in, into the backbone, compounding the issue and, and causing a whole lot of a whole lot of problems. Um, so yeah, uh, BGP routes, you know, being mismanaged or possibly intentionally messed with have actually caused uh, providers to disappear off the face of the net before. Like there was, uh, there was one BGP change I remember in recent memory that since all of Google's traffic, because Google messed up by, I think it was Google anyway, some, some large service provider messed up and uh, literally sent every single piece of their traffic to one very tiny ISP in the middle of the like rural United States. Oh, I completely, remember that. Completely, completely, like not permanently destroying, but utterly overwhelming all of that ISP's equipment and basically taking them and their small community off the net for some time until Google said, oh, whoops, that was that was us. We'll back out this change now. Um, so yeah, if, if you want to do a little bit of research on BGP, and I'm sure that's uh, it's going to be a future episode for us talking about all the potential security gaffes that can happen with uh, mismanaged BGP routes. It'll be a fun read. Um, so yeah, Cloudflare. The, I mean, the problem is, is that the inter I, I don't understand how the internet like just operates. It is such, it is, it's always hanging by the smallest string. And every time we come here with another story, it's, it's like, wow, what, this is amazing. Uh, the sharks eating the underwater sea cables. I always love that one. It's like, yep. wait, you could take out a continent because the sharks are eating the underwater sea cables. Uh, uh, Cloudflare goes down. If uh, Or if someone decides to DDoS you and now you have to pay for Cloudflare to protect you, it's, again, another another issue that you have to worry about. So the whole issue of the internet relying on six or seven different companies is, is still amazing to me, but that's how it works. Yeah. You know, part of, part of the promise of the internet infrastructure was, you know, decentralization and, and we're going to get, you know, get out from, you know, big single source providers because people looked at, you know, the telephone system and how that operated. And yeah, there were small players, but it was mostly Ma Bell. It was mostly these, these giant companies like AT&T and MCI controlling giant chunks of the network. And the net was intentionally designed to be this decentralized resource. Unfortunately, because of various mostly economic reasons, uh, we've all centralized on a small handful of providers, which on one hand makes some things really easy, like... You know, I, I don't know about you, but, you know, getting virtual servers from a variety of cloud providers has never been easier. You know, you throw five bucks at a screen and you've got a server. It's up and running in seconds. And that's that's fantastic. The unfortunate part is when one of these things goes down, it's got a really wide blast area, like just levels chunks of the Internet, which isn't great. We I, I kind of want to not necessarily go fully back to the decentralized funnel, but maybe try to find a way to split the difference or use big providers where it makes sense, but then have a backup that's kind of locally run. There's there's a lot of talk in, in various internet communities and networking communities about that very thing, but it's interesting. I will tell you that the cloud is located in Northern Virginia. If you ever wanted to know where the cloud was, Anywhere. I legally cannot comment on, on where where any clouds may or may not be, except in the sky. There are clearly clouds in the sky right now. I can't actually see any clouds. I apologize. It's dark here. But anyway, we're, we're going to move on from Cloudflare. <clears throat> Another topic we actually talked about recently was VPNs and how we really couldn't recommend VPNs because or commercial VPNs. Let's go with that. Because we don't know if they're logging things, as in... So when you go to a website, your your ISP knows it, and then the 
and how it gets there. Everyone there knows it. By going through a VPN, you come out the other side and only that endpoint knows where you're going. Basically, you're creating an encrypted pipe between you and that server that then goes out, gets you the information, and it's supposed to bring a level of, of uh, security to you. The problem is if, that, if the NSA knows that, they t target the endpoints and they say, give us all your logs or they'll just get the logs up and and we have problems. So we tell you to find VPNs that do not log. So these seven said they don't, but guess what? They lied. And the problem is they lied and they're located in Hong Kong. So now the Chinese government has these logs. And for Americans like you and me, or for the Americans here, it's probably not the end of the world. It's not like they're not giving it to the NSA. Like, I'm not worried about that. But if you're in Hong Kong or if you're a Chinese citizen or something like that, you may have a little bit more to worry about than that. So it's just one of those things. Here's another black, a black eye on the, the commercial VPNs who say, hey, we don't log. And without an audit, we have no idea. And uh, there's there's a fun a fun deeper story here about why this happened. So uh, these VPN services you've probably seen a bazillion. Like if you've watched any YouTube, if you've seen podcasts, except for ours because we don't run ads. Um, if you look anywhere, especially TV commercials, you'll see you know this VPN, that VPN. Buy now, three months free. You know they're everywhere. Well, are they really that easy to set up? And the answer is yeah. There's actually uh, a company that um, we are going to anti-recommend um, that uh, there is um, I, basically a lot of these VPNs, at least the ones uh, caught up in this breach, uh, are all just rebranded products from one main provi uh, provider. Um, and they literally just, you know, slapped their, their branding on this provider's product and shipped it out and said, yeah, that's good enough. We're, we're a VPN service now. Um, that's pretty dangerous because you don't know what you're running. But on top of that, it looks like the provider maintained an Elasticsearch database, uh, which is actually a really cool database product on its own. The issue with Elasticsearch is actually that it's, or was, insecure by default. Uh, up until May of last year, you actually had to pay for a like an actual license or sign up for something to get these security modules that allow you to do things like lock down certain access to certain tables, make authorized users, you know, the stuff you would expect from literally any database platform that was designed to be used on the internet, you had to pay for those, uh, which is really unfortunate. So this main service provider had an Elasticsearch cluster wide open on the net, and that's where they were doing all their logging. So uh, yeah, if your product is not secure by default, if you are building a product where users have to pay to make it safer, um, if, if you are a consumer of a product where you have had to pay for extra security features, it's not right, it's not good, and it's actually morally incorrect. Uh, security should never be a value add, security should be the default mode. And we talk about default saving lives here. Here's another example where if this software, if Elasticsearch was secure by default out of the box, we wouldn't be talking about this story. Again, a lot of these offer a free version of it, and that should be your first, that should be your first red flag. We always talk about, at least with uh, VPNs, pay for the service because they have their servers to run. So how are they getting you that free service if they have servers to run? They're either injecting ads. How are they injecting ads? If they're relevant at all, that means they're doing something. And and again, it's $5 a month or whatever it is, $10 a month. They have to pay the bill somehow. So what you're doing is you're hoping that that money doesn't make you the product and they're doing the right thing. And you're hoping that they did it right. And here's an example of where they did it wrong. And this goes back to, and this is not the right answer, but it's at least one answer. Get yourself a Raspberry Pi. We did an episode on WireGuard. Uh, there's, um, we talked about pivpn.io. That's the link there. That it's like one button click. The only problem is it routes all your traffic through your home network. And if you're at home and you want to go and you want a VPN, so you're not at home, you can't do that. So then we can we can recommend services that do like through uh, uh, VPSs, like you said, five dollars. You throw five dollars at a screen, you can run your own VPN service through there. But again, it's one of those you have to check. But check with your again. 
some companies have them, but again, the company sees it. Some schools have it, but then again, the schools see it. So you really, really have to do your research. And I'm almost at the point that to say any commercial VPN is probably not a good thing. If you want to stream Netflix from the B, if you want to stream the BBC, fine, pay somebody five bucks. Who really cares that you're stealing BBC content? But if you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing, that that is requires more security. Uh, just be very careful, like just be really careful. And just to say these seven VPNs, so we're not uh, burying the lead here. It's from VPN Mentor. Um, oh, no, no, they are the ones who did the report. The seven yeah. VPNs are UFO VPN, Fast VPN, Free VPN, Super VPN, Flash VPN, Secure VPN, and Rabbit VPN. So I've never like, heard of any of them. Yeah, if, if you're using any of those, please stop. <laughs> if you are paying them money, uh, you probably you probably don't want to anymore. Um, there there are other VPN companies out there that are kind of reputable, but I totally agree. If you're doing something that absolutely requires security, or you know, it's it's a little more than watching Netflix in a different country. Yeah, paying for a commercial VPN probably isn't the route you want to go. There's there's enough there that can get you into trouble that you just don't want to do it. Some of them are now advertising an audit that was done. So somebody went through and did it. And again, they get paid through affiliates. So saying that you should have this company or that company, watch out that the person's not making money. And if you're okay yeah. with that, you're obviously okay with that. Uh, the, but check, some of them are going through audits. Some of them are, are opening, the, opening everything up to security researchers. Check, uh, check where they're located, all these other things. And again, it's it's one of those you have to ask yourself what is your threat model if your threat model is that you have to have this trust no one bulletproof thing then you have to do a lot of research again if you're trying to watch bbc content in new york so maybe so it's one of those you turn on one of these hijack vpns and you'll be fine N nobody really has to worry so <sighs> that's what that's yeah. all i have on there i got nothing else on vpns yeah, no, that's that's about mm. it. So I lost the time when the recording crashed. But anyway, we're going to talk about our main story of Twitter. So I don't know if you heard last week, a lot of a lot of prominent Twitter accounts got hacked. And and the, and they were saying, hey, pa praise us or we're going to give you if you give us Bitcoin, we're going to double it back in the next day or two. It's the old Nigerian prince scam. Give us money. We'll double it or whatever it is. Um, and I think they ended up making a million dollars, which is a lot of money. But if you had Joe Biden's account, if you had Barack Obama's account, if you had Bill Gates's account, Elon Musk, Apple, Coinbase, you had a lot of power to uh, to ask for only a million dollars. That I mean, think big, think yeah, way I'm, bigger than that. Like, uh, of course, we're we're not ever going to tell you, hey, committing fraud is cool. I'm like, no, no, of course not. Uh, but I'm I'm with you. I'm honestly a little disappointed. Like, they they pulled a cryptocurrency scam. What they could have done is they could have tweeted out like some salacious news about you know one of these people's companies driven the stock price down bought it dip and then instantly watched for it to skyrocket back up when it when everyone realized it was a scam especially with with uh you know the political figures that they they had these accounts for you could cause some serious damage like if not economic damage but like even prep people for war like like there's a whole lot of power in twitter that it probably shouldn't be there. Like we put a lot of emphasis on this platform, which was, uh, it used to be 140 characters of people talking about what kind of French fries they had that day. Like it is not supposed to be a platform for this sort of thing, uh, but it is, that's that's the modern world. Um, and a cryptocurrency scam is honestly probably the least damaging thing that they can do yeah people lost a lot of money yeah it's unfortunate yeah it really it's super bad that these scammers you know at least for now have gotten away with it but i'm i'm really thankful that it wasn't worse because it absolutely could have been absolutely i want to know i want to know how does grandma send one bitcoin to joe biden 
that's my problem. So they're only going after the stu- the stupid technologists, tech uh, te- uh, people in technology with uh, with Coinbase. Like it's, and I guess they're trying to figure out how they how they can do it without getting caught. This and that. Look, it's it's there's still conspiracy theories going out that this was the first step. Now they have more. They have this. They have that. They have all these other things, but. Honestly, I think is they took their million dollars and they walked away. But again, you work so yeah. hard for the million dollars. What it looks like was a social engineering scam that they were able to get access through one of the employees who was either a mole inside or just just socially engineered. And they put software, they got software on the computer and they were able to access these accounts. I mean, I think it's as simple as that. To, to go into the exact details is not worth it for this. Uh, we'll link uh, from Bruce Schneier what he thinks, but but again, that's they literally went on somebody. They got somebody to basically give them the password. It bypasses two factor. It bypasses everything. It just now they can tweet and 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 I really think that they they went the wrong. Di- Look, I'm happy that they went the wrong direction. Remember, one of the, some other account got hacked really early on, and they just spewed a whole lot of racist nonsense. Yeah, and, or Mark Zuckerberg's, I think, got hacked, and they they were spewing racist nonsense. But they could have done so much more, and I don't know why they didn't. But I'm happy that they didn't. Yeah. So from what from what Schneier and and you know Twitter support is saying, it, it looks like it just really well targeted social engineering. Uh, of, of a Twitter employee. Um, so, you know, whether there's a lot of a lot of talk about, you know, was somebody paid off? Was this an inside job? And, you know, honestly, while those are more interesting and while they would be cool and, you know, almost fun to report on, I generally the more boring tale is the more realistic one. Um, I'm, I'm going to place my bets. I mean, I'm going to throw my money down the table and say that this is nothing more than you know, decently well-targeted social engineering. They got into Twitter's internal systems and used it to pull off a cryptocurrency scam. And you know, at the end of the day, with the amount of damage that you could do with that platform, uh, that's that's gotta be easy mode. I think we got off easy on this one. Now, of course, Twitter reversed everything. They're making changes to try to fix this stuff and try to prevent this from happening again. Uh, and it's yeah, it's not all sunshine and rainbows over at Twitter. They're they're dealing with a fire right now, and I I feel for those admins and developers. Um, and you know this if if you get uh, if you get some some of that mandatory security training coming down from your IT department, yeah, that's why we do these things. Um, it's annoying, but we hope that you know maybe one person is going to think. I don't know. Did did Bob really send that spreadsheet? I mean, it's called it's called like directorpresentation.ppt.exe. That might be suspicious. I'm going to forward this to IT because if it gets through to one person who is targeted with this kind of social engineering, congratulations, you just prevented a world class attack like this. Uh, and like most of the best computer hacks out there, it's not about defeating the technology or hacking the Gibson or hack the planet. Uh, it's about how do we convince Sue in HR to give us her password so we can get inside? Like it's it's all like you know how how do we convince Bill in finance to to send us the the financials, right? It's all like really boring hacks. It's always really boring human trickery. Uh, if, to, if you to get really this kind of data, if you really really hate your IT department, and I don't recommend this, but. It depends how you want to go out. If you get any financial things and you think it's phishing, the FBI field office. That's how you do it. <laughs> because because who knows if it's a social engineering attack, you don't want to be on the hook for, for wire fraud. So sending it back to your IT department in May should even – so some IT departments like to send you fake ones so they can see if their workers are there. I think the right answer, and don't actually do this, is to send it to the FBI and let them deal with it and when you get called in to say but you told me to watch out i did the right thing don't actually do that but (laughs) and in just just in case that you're worried about you know like your it people thinking you're paranoid or bothering them or that you're giving them work to do and they've already got so much to do the printer hasn't worked in three weeks Uh, consider this then being like bugged or inconvenienced by you sending out a message that's like, hey, 
everyone, is this legit? Does this make sense? Is this fishing? Right? Like, try to try to weigh that against the amount of work that IT has to do if it is a fish, phishing message and now you've compromised your company, right? Like, reviewing an email, I would do that a hundred times a day before I would deal with the security breach just once. It is so much less work to be able to say, no, no, this is this is legit. It came from our servers. It's fine. There's nothing fishing about this. Yeah, it looks kind of suspicious. We're going to make sure that John doesn't send any more emails from his <laughs> personal account. Um, right? It's way, way easier for IT departments to deal with suspected phishing than it is to deal with a security incident. So don't feel bad. That's what your IT department is there for. That's what your security people are there for. Use them. It's their job. They yes. signed up for this. So people were asking, and my first thing was, Joe Biden's account got hacked. And he is former vice president, Barack Obama, former president. Was Donald uh, was our president Donald Trump's account hacked? And the answer was no, because there was extra special protections, which questions, uh, which for me questions the fact why why isn't a presidential candidate? We had this four years ago, a presidential presumptive pres uh, Democratic pre uh, presidential candidate also not have said special protections. But I I'm not in Twitter's uh, security team, but. That that was the first question. Did uh, the, the president get hacked? And and we're still not sure. Just Twitter is coming out and saying they have extra special protections. We don't know what actually that means, but yeah. From uh, from what everyone is saying, it looks like it looks like Trump's account was not hacked. At least not that anyone can see or is saying. Um, and Twitter is is uh, not going into exactly what kind of protections they have on his account, um, but they do have extra special presidential protections on that account. Because uh, it seems that uh, Twitter has become the official medium, uh, not not to get political, of course. I mean, the, I guess they don't they don't they don't know what Kofefi means either, but. Yeah, that that was really really the only thing the hackers were after was the definition of Kofefi. Um, Still don't have it. Sorry. You would think that the extra special protections, we, we would figure that out. Yeah. It's it's Project Kovefi is is the, the Twitter project for that. So. I'm lying. It, That's not. That don't don't yeah, put that on right CNET here. or anything. I'm, I'm lying about this. I just made it for a laugh. Yeah. So anyway, that those are the big stories of last week. And we had, I mean, all three of those things came out exactly last week. So it looks like things are coming up. DEF CON is in two weeks. Uh, the schedule is already out. So if you've never been to DEF CON, you can actually watch it virtually, whatever that means. We still don't know. Um, I, I saw the first day of talks. It looks like there's some pretty good things. Now people can do live de recorded demos and they'll be okay because they're doing it from their Zoom. So, so. I'm hoping to have actually cool exploits that you can do at home, how to how to do things that you can actually do, and we can go from there. So I will say, as much as I love the spectacle of a live demo, the amount of them that I've seen work perfectly is just a meager handful. I would absolutely love for everyone to move to these recorded demos because you know they're going to work. If they're recorded, hopefully they didn't just record a bum demo. Uh, so we might not have any any demo fails at DEF CON this year. That would be really nice. So it's I'm still bummed out that I can't go to Vegas and see my 30,000 closest friends. But it's one of those, what can you do? I'd rather be safe. Anyway, that's it for us. Uh, we will hopefully see you next week with better security news rather than ever. the world is ending and we're all getting hacked. So bye, everyone.